In October 2021, a woman vanished in West Yorkshire, having literally only got married days before. It should have been the start of a happy new chapter in her life. Whilst friends and family went out and searched for her, one man would know the truth behind her disappearance. It would soon lead to a horrific discovery and uncover a relationship built on violence and abuse. This is the murder of Dawn Walker. my lovelies, change of scenery because I am presenting today's true crime video from my bed because Emma Matteras has kindly sponsored this video and actually truth be told it's just an excuse for me to do this and be unbelievably comfy. For me sleep is really important psychologically but there's a whole host of reasons why it's so important. For example it's a mood booster, it improves attention, it improves immunity and more than anything, let's be honest, who does not like cuddling under the covers? I love my Emma mattress for lots of reasons. In fact, my whole family in my home have exactly the same mattress. We've all got one of these beauties. It's seriously comfortable. It makes going to bed even more of a pleasure, if that's possible. What's more, this product comes with a 10 year guarantee. They're really confident that you'll love it. Also with a 200 night trial, that's how confident they are that you're gonna love this Emma mattress. And I'm not surprised because it's absolutely gorgeous. You can get an incredible discount by following the link in the description below. And I promise you, you will not regret it. You will just be super comfortable super calm and super rested after a night on one of these bad boys. So if you fancy getting some amazing night's sleep, why don't you click on the link in the description below and you will get 50% off at Emma. But also, if you pop in the code Kenny, you'll get an extra discount as well. Right, let's get on with today's true crime video. 52-year-old Dawn Walker was described by people who knew her as kind, caring, a family oriented woman, a generous woman. She had three daughters, Cody, Kalena, and Kira Lee. She was also a grandmother. She was close to her children. And it's important to note that whilst all of this is anecdotal and people talk about the dead in certain ways, certainly from what I've learned about Dawn, she was considered a really lovely human being. And if anything, she was considered vulnerable, not because she had any flaws in her nature, but more simply because she was an individual who was potentially more forgiving than she should have been. And I think that lots of people relate to the fact that at times in our lives, we put up with things that we shouldn't have put up with. And whilst a lot of us can judge ourselves harshly for being this way and allowing people into our lives who maybe are not the best people for us, it tends to be because we are open, compassionate, forgiving, empathetic. They're qualities that sh we shouldn't be ashamed of. Dawn lived with a partner, and that was 45-year-old scrap metal dealer Thomas Nutt. They lived on Shirley Grove in Lightcliffe, that's near Halifax in West Yorkshire. What is known about this couple is that when people saw them in public they were often very smiley and they gave a front that suggested that their relationship was to some degree in a relatively okay place but behind the scenes it seems like there was a very different story and again we all appreciate that the way that we act in public with our partner is often very different to how we are in our homes because we have the etiquette of society and the judgments of others. And also we have the medium and mediation that being in public 
create. So even people with poor boundaries in relationships will often seemingly act in an appropriate manner when they know that there are people around them in the general public because they are aware that their actions behind closed doors would draw attention if they displayed them in that environment. Now it turns out that behind those closed doors, Nut was an incredibly controlling, possessive, and a very abusive man. So throughout the relationship, Dawn had basically been on the receiving end of very violent, and I mean extremely violent and aggressive behavior. Bear in mind what I've told you, this guy dealt with scrap metal. It's a physicality involved in that job. He was also a big man. Dawn was tiny. She was five feet tall. So when you think about the sheer disparity in their body size and the physicality that that would have prevented Dawn using against a man who was being violent towards her, the mismatch is very, very obvious. And he used that considerable size to his advantage. It was all about bullying her and it was about controlling basically every single aspect of her life. And people said, those who really knew her, those who truly understood that what was going on behind those closed doors was so worrying that she was actually really terrified of him. And a lot of people will always say, well, why on earth was she in a relationship with somebody that she was terrified of because of that reason? Because if you are terrified of somebody, if you feel that they have got potential to do you enormous harm, if you fear for your life, if you antagonize them in any way, then of course, many times you will remain in that situation because the idea of removing yourself carries dire consequences that you just don't want to take a risk on. Now, Nut did have three children from a previous relationship and that relationship had lasted 10 years, but there was actually a restraining order against him. So he wasn't even allowed to see his ex-partner, Kimberly Alec, or his children. So instantly we can see that there is a big problem in this man's actions and behaviors. The previous relationship, he'd obviously so seriously affected the safety of those individuals that he was just carte blanche not allowed to see his ex or his kids. And bear in mind that very often, sometimes as far as I'm concerned, without reason, we see that children are still allowed to see abusive parents. I don't get it. I don't understand it. The courts seem to have this idea that if a partner is belting their wife or their husband, that somehow they can still reasonably see a child and be a reasonable kind of role model. But this is how it is today. Do I think that that is really in the best interest of the children? No. But the fact is that Nut wasn't allowed to see his kids. So there was some serious concerns about this man's type of potential and form. When I looked at why that was, well, it turns out that he had been incredibly domestically abusive throughout most of the previous relationship. In the first two years, he'd actually not been violent. And I think that that is how abusers manage to connect with a partner build a relationship that seems to be safe, makes that partner feel that they are loved, often love bombs them, almost act as if they are the perfect person, the individual that that individual has been waiting for all of their lives. And by the time the bad behavior begins, the partner has developed these really authentic loving feelings. And when the abuse starts, it blindsides them. And they're constantly thinking, well, maybe I've done something wrong because this person was amazing for two years. But that's the key. That's how predators work. It's pretty easy to control even the darkest and most malevolent of behaviors for a period of time. Two years is not a long time in a relationship. So you can coerce that person and fool that person into believing you're a good person. And then your partner who's now receiving the violence is questioning themselves and imagining that they must have done something wrong because you've been so nice to them previously. So after this initial honeymoon period in that relationship, 
he then starts the classic abuser behavior. So he starts isolating her from her family and friends. Also, he starts taking control of her finances. So very coercive in nature. Also, Kimberly had the physical attacks again and again and again. And he would regularly beat her in front of her children. So he has no consideration for the impact of those children witnessing this abuse. He really doesn't consider his fatherly role at any point in that moment, which is to protect those children. And it shows that he has no boundaries whatsoever as regards his behavior. He's quite happy to act however he chooses, no matter who that affects. In 2015, he actually tells Kimberly that he's gonna kill her. And he dragged her downstairs by her throat and he punched her. And apparently the only time that the violence stopped whilst that assault was happening was that their five-year-old child had actually screamed and this had kind of stopped him from continuing that violent assault. On another occasion, they disagreed over the naming of their child, which is a completely common argument. I actually lost the argument when it came down to my second child. My second child's called Evan. I wanted him to be called something else, but apparently it was a little bit out there. And because my first child I've made that name up. I wasn't essentially allowed. But at the end of the day, that's what compromise and collaboration is about. You listen to one another, you accept your differences, and you decide on something that makes sense to both of you. But no, he went mad. Nut went off it. He was so angry that she just didn't accept what he wanted, that he punched her in the face repeatedly. And then he literally took her phone and he wouldn't even let her leave the house. Domestic abusers at this level are getting to a point where without a doubt, the individual they are with's life is definitely at risk. Controlling finances, isolating from family, physically abusing, refusing that individual contact because the phone has been removed and locking her in a home. These are all escalation behaviors and it's only going in one direction. Very often, these are the moments where women have to really consider the potential of these individuals that they're sharing their lives with because it's only going in a very negative direction and it's highly unlikely that that's going to end or get any better in any other way unless they remove themselves from the situation, which is, again, incredibly challenging. He actually stopped her from reporting the incident. So she's not even allowed to seek the help that she needed. She's just totally isolated and terrified. And she described him as a Jekyll and Hyde character. So clearly she wants to leave him. But the problem that she's got is she has this belief system that maybe he'd take the children and that in itself terrified her the idea that she wouldn't be able to be the mother to her children that she wished to be. And that ultimately led to her feeling like she was living in a prison. And he later attacks her again. And this is during a disagreement about whether her older children should be allowed to see Nut's father. But this is such a serious assault that he splits her head open. That demonstrates a capacity to kill. If you can attack somebody so brutally that you split their head open, then you absolutely could have killed them. Later, he's found guilty of common assault and she's ultimately moved to a safe house and granted the non-molestation order, which she absolutely needed, without a shadow of a doubt. We know that just from what I've described, the violence is becoming more and more problematic and this woman suffered 10 years at that man's hands. Kimberly was absolutely convinced retrospectively when she looked at her relationship that not hated women, that he just couldn't stand them, and that as far as she was concerned, she, he would kill somebody one day. That was her belief system, that this was a man who she felt had such rage within him and such a foundation of disdain towards females that she couldn't imagine anything other than it bubbling over and finally destroying a female life. Now, she had thankfully escaped, but of course, Dawn is now in his clutches. 
And I use the word clutches for very good reason because I think that that's very demonstrative of the emotional way it feels when you're in a relationship with a domestic abuser. You feel like they have you tightly held and there's nothing you can do to get out of their reach. And that's why it's so suffocating and terrifying. Also, it's really worth noting, and I think that Kimberly is a pretty amazing human being actually for doing this, because she'd contacted Dawn and said, look, you need to know what nut is like, and you need to understand that you could potentially be in a very, very dangerous situation. But at the time that she did that, Dawn didn't believe her. And I think this is a very, very common experience. If you're in a new relationship with a partner, you're going to have listened to their bias. They're going to have told you stories about their past. It's very rare that you get into a relationship and a partner says, turns out I'm an absolute ass, really violent, totally inappropriate where boundaries are concerned, being quite dangerous in my life. You need to know this information before we start a relationship because I don't want to be that person anymore. That's not whatever happens, is it? Everybody's always a victim in their own story. So you can bet your bottom dollar that Nut will have met Dawn and talked about how awful Kimberly was and how she made all this stuff up about him, which is why he can't see his children. And that means that Dawn will have formed a picture about Kimberly that means that the moment that Kimberly gets in contact with her and starts talking about Nut, the likelihood is that the foundations will have been laid by him so that Dawn dismisses this advice. And also, he will have been being lovely to her at this point, love bombing her, making her feel super special. And so she won't have grounds to connect with what she's being told. Bit of a advice here as well for people. Just because an ex is an ex doesn't mean we shouldn't listen to what information that they have. Yes, it could be that they're being malicious. Yes, it could be that realistically they want to get back with the partner that you've now arrived in a relationship with but it can also be that they've got good reason to because they want to protect you and ultimately if somebody has done that and then you see your partner's behavior change you should absolutely listen to that advice because the reality is they could be saving you years of terrible abuse. Dawn and Nut had only met in late 2018. It's unbelievable to me to be able to tell this story in 2022. The fact that they weren't even a couple until late 2018. And they met through Facebook. Now Dawn was really initially very, very happy. Of course she was, she'd been single for 12 years. It was new, exciting, refreshing. He was very loving towards her. The relationship develops really quickly and they soon move in together. Of course they do, because one of the very clear things that would be written in the How to Be a Domestic Abuser guidebook would be love bomb them, cement yourself in their life as quickly as possible, move in with them so you have control. But again, when you're falling in love, and certainly Dawn was, you're not thinking that way because you're not a hideous predator, which Nut is. She's not believing this guy is anything but potentially a dream come true. Now, at the time that they moved in together, Dawn's 18-year-old daughter, Kira Lee, actually still lived at home with her, but she basically gets kicked out after her 18th birthday. And the reason for that is that Nut is constantly arguing with her. Bear in mind, this happens really quickly. And at 18, you're still a young person. And certainly the priority from a parent should still be with you and your well-being. But this demonstrates that Dawn, very early on, doesn't feel that she has a lot of options to defend what she wants. I have no doubt whatsoever that she would have wanted her child to still be in the home. But Nut is so aggressive and bully-like that actually for a quiet life and also for her self-protection, she allows this to occur. But that's because he is already in a assertive controlling state. And whilst most of us right now wish that she would have just kicked him out, this isn't how it plays out in domestically abusive relationships. So her 18-year-old daughter actually moves to Egypt after this. Now, she does actually come home from Egypt, that's for 10 days to visit friends and family, and she noted that the change in her mum was just shocking. 
there was something really notable that she could see had changed in the way that her mum acted and behaved, the way that her mum looked. And she recalled that on one occasion, her mum was really ill and she went to bed. We can all agree that if a partner is really ill and needs to go to bed, you, as a loving companion, will do things like, I don't know, make soup for them, take them some Lucozade like we used to in the 1980s, give them grapes. I've no idea why people choose grapes by hospital bedsides. Maybe it was the carry-on films that started the trend. But certainly, when I was a kid, that's what you got, Lucozade and grapes. But what I'm saying is, certainly in relationships when a partner is not well, you have a duty of care and a duty through love to make sure that you are looking after them as best as you can, not as far as not was concerned. Oh no. He essentially felt that the fact that she had gone to bed was a personal attack on him to some degree because his needs were not being met. Basically, she didn't make his tea. So her daughter said that what she actually saw play out was that not just shouted at dawn, because he wasn't happy about the fact that he hadn't provided her with a hot meal. Arguably, yes, it seems that Nook comes from a time period where women were at home starching men's shirts and imagining what kind of delicacy they can make in some sort of vegetable terrine shape. This is not what we expect men in the modern age to be like anyway, but again, it demonstrates that he doesn't care about how she feels, he cares about his own needs only. He's incredibly egocentric, incredibly selfish, and completely without understanding of another human being's needs. And that is disturbing to imagine, particularly when somebody is unwell. Whenever I talk about examples of behavior like that, instantly in my head, I have a flash of what would happen if that occurred in my household. If I was in bed unwell and my husband shouted at me to make the tea. Hmm. One would imagine he would end up either wearing said tea or I don't know, falling ill after he ate his tea. Anyway, arguably her daughter realizes this is just totally inappropriate and she also said that he accused Dawn of being a different person because her daughter was there. So again, using the relationship with her daughter as an example of a problem in their relationship to further isolate and fracture the relationship with Kira Lee, which is incredibly manipulative. And bear in mind, she'd only been back for 10 days and she'd been kicked out just after her 18th birthday because of him. So Kira Lee does return to Egypt, but then shortly after she ends up coming back to live in the UK and she does move back with her mother and not. This is because she discovers that she's pregnant and it also invites us to understand the fact that Dawn obviously wanted Kira Lee back with her. It's not who's causing the division and problems because evidently by the fact that Kira Lee is allowed home initially, it demonstrates that Dawn would be the one leading that decision to allow her daughter back. Kira Lee said, on returning, the whole situation was worse than ever. So Nut was constantly shouting at Dawn. And very much like Kimberly, Nut's ex, Kira Lee mirrors the beliefs that she's expressed, which is that as far as she's concerned, when she watches not around women in general, including herself, but certainly her mother, it's like he had no respect for women whatsoever. She also said that she never saw him treat men in the same way. So as far as men were concerned, he was cool with them. He was kind to them. He was reasonable around them and he wasn't aggressive. And there's two ways of looking at that. One way is we can say, okay, psychologically, he didn't value females. And certainly we can evidence that in lots of individuals who are predators, that they generally have a disdain for females. And arguably the treatment that he bestows on both Dawn and his ex evidences a lack of respect without a doubt. But that isn't necessarily because he values men. <laughs> I mean, people like this rarely value anything apart from what gives them the most attention and gain. What we can say is that Nut knows that a man 
would beat the living daylights out of him. Cowards will often be respectful to people they're afraid of, to people that they feel are their equals or betters. And the truth is on a physical level, a woman is never gonna be your equal or better on the whole. So arguably, this reaction to men may be less about respect and more about fear. Because men who attack women, they tend to be huge cowards. And the minute that somebody confronts them or takes an issue with them, they run in the opposite direction because they know that a man will beat their ass, basically. We then get to September 2020, and Dawn is really seriously assaulted by Nort. And this attack was one where people visibly could see her injuries. She had a really big black eye, she had cuts, and she had a swollen lip and cheeks. So you can imagine the amount of force a lot of us will have had accidents. Some of us will have been unfortunate enough to get black eyes. It takes a pretty big whack to be in a scenario like that. Even with a bust lip, all of these things take considerable force. We're talking about a fully swollen face. There has been a large amount of impact when we are looking at injuries like that. And Nut was ultimately convicted of assault in Dawn on that occasion, and rightly so. At this point, with his history, can we all agree just to place him in prison and lose the key for eternity. I personally believe nothing bad could come of such decisions. Again, I know I'm not in charge of the world or the law. I appreciate if I was, there would probably be quite a few more prisons and some may not think that the life convictions for the things that individuals have done were really appropriate but I'm just saying our streets would be safer and there would be quite big deterrents. But anyway, she's brave because he actually does get convicted and that's a scary place for a woman who's being abused. It really is because you feel that you've then become the aggressor and taken the power off the perpetrator and that puts you in a precarious position. Now he serves a short prison sentence and it's during this incarceration that Dawn actually confides in her daughter and says, this isn't just violence that I'm experiencing. It isn't simply this coercive control that is destroying my life. It's not only these horrific experiences that I'm dealing with physically where violence is concerned. He's also raped me. That in itself introduces us to the violation level that this woman is experiencing. There is no area of her relationship that brings her anything but pain. And it seems at this point that Dawn's had a really narrow escape from this abusive partner. And we all want Dawn at this moment in time to realize and recognize that she deserves more, that this is her opportunity to leave. This is her opportunity to remove herself from this situation for good, to accept that this man is a terrible person, to accept that this man is escalating in his violence and has the potential to do enormous harm, even more than she's already encountered and experienced. But following his release, she gets back together with him. Now Dawn tells her daughter that the reason that she does this is because she loves him. And I think one of the real struggles that so many people have when they look at cases like this is they look at people like Dawn and say, why? Why would you, when this guy has beaten you black and blue to the point where he's been incarcerated, where an ex-partner has told you her life was made hell by him, where your life has basically been at risk, you've had your head split open, where he controls every element and aspect of your world to a point where you have no control. My God, where you can't even be ill in bed for a day without being abused. But the problem is that somebody can go through what I call bad love, as in it's bad for that person, it's toxic, but it's still love. And Dawn, of course we don't believe she should, but she feels this connection with him. And also, when somebody controls all of your life in so many ways, even though it is a toxic prison to exist in, ironically, it's one that you know 
you bizarrely get used to being controlled in all these different ways. And when you're free of that, you can almost feel like you're free falling. Now, all of us realize that it's far better to free fall. It will be a softer landing and a better foundation when you build up again without these kind of monsters in your world. But that's why it's so challenging for people who are abused to remove themselves from these situations. And it's also difficult when people bear heavy judgments on people who cannot control to some degree their feelings and the confusion of the experience of being in an abusive relationship and return to those places because people often think, well, you had a choice and you chose to go back. Therefore, essentially, you were willing to accept this kind of hostile environment and this hostility that you endured but it's just not the case it's just a very confusing environment much of which is about that person hoping that they individual change thinking about the good times believing that they have some good points if only they can change their behavior for the better they won't hit them anymore and so on and so forth it's incredibly confusing and i would imagine that when he's been to prison Dawn genuinely believes, well, this is going to give him the kick up the ass that he needs. He's going to realize, I can't do this again. The police have been involved. I don't want to lose Dawn. I'm going to change my behavior. And I imagine that he said all of that to her. And so now she feels that maybe, just maybe, he's going to come good on his promises. So after he gets out and they get back together, they soon get engaged. And then they're making wedding arrangements. But, of course, no, it hasn't changed at all. His controlling, abusive, manipulative behaviour just continues. And the neighbours, they actually could hear them arguing constantly. And people who knew Dawn said that she wasn't a happy bride looking forward to a wedding. She was really anxious. They noted that she didn't seem excited about the event whatsoever. And arguably it looked like she was just on a train that was traveling to a destination that she didn't even want to attend they said that they could see that he was becoming even more controlling even more possessive so instead of him relinquishing all of this negative behavior because of his experience in prison it seems that it's only amplified it Towards the latter end of 2020, and I would very much imagine at this point, we see Dawn starting to think that she shouldn't have got back with him, and also that she's looking at reasons as to why she should definitely remove herself from the relationship. She's trying to find more factors that can encourage her to make, in my opinion, a change to her life and a transition from this relationship because she's obviously getting more concerned about the way that he's treating her. So she goes ahead and she contacts Kimberly, that's Nut's ex, and she just asks her, can you let me know why you took the restraining order out on him? And she also says to Kimberly, he's accusing me of cheating on him. She also said that he was scaring her to death, that he scared the hell out of her, said that he'd been abusive towards her, even said that he'd nearly killed her during an attack earlier in the year. So Dawn is literally able not only to acknowledge that Kimberly has obviously got information that is important for her to hear, but she's also confiding in this woman that one of the assaults, as far as she was concerned, could literally have ended her life. And so Kimberly has the opportunity here to explain the truth about the abusive 10-year relationship that she'd endured with Noor. And she actually told Dawn, he'll end up killing you one day. Get out. It's really awful to imagine that Kimberly and Dawn had this conversation. Here we have Dawn in the present managing this hostility and abuse on a daily level. And here we have the woman of his past talking about how dangerous he was, solidifying and confirming Dawn's worst fears, but also that warning, he'll kill you one day. I mean, it's chilling that those words were spoken directly to Dawn, inevitably to express a reality that was soon to play out. On the 25th of August, 2021, Willa Neighbour heard screams from Dawn and Nut's property. They said they'd never heard screams like it before. And actually, this neighbour is the kind of neighbour we all wish to have. I mean that. How many times in my videos do I say the words risk offending? 
if you hear screaming and shouting and banging, if you hear people in distress, go and investigate or call the emergency services because that risk of offence may just save a life. And in this case, this neighbour, they're not having it. And they don't even call the emergency services. They're like, I'm going to handle this myself. So they basically rush around. They hammered on the door continuously for over five minutes. They did not let up. And they could hear Dawn screaming, get off me, Tom, leave me alone. But that neighbour kept knocking. Ultimately, they actually tried the door handle and it was actually unlocked. And he entered the house. And with respect, that shows courage and bravery and people like this they are saviors in circumstances such as this and the neighbor actually shouted what the f are you doing leave her alone and at this point he said that he saw not appear at the top of the stairs and that he looked really mad and what not actually does is say you know what everything's fine it's just that dawn's had an asthma attack i mean clutching at straws not clutching at straws I have asthma, I've had asthma attacks, let me tell you. At no point whatsoever am I banging around screaming for mercy. That's not happening, that doesn't occur. One, because when you're having an asthma attack, the last thing you want to be doing is screaming because you're trying to breathe, you know? Kind of defies the object of getting air into your lungs by screaming hysterically. That's not going to happen nor is it that you're going to be throwing furniture around a room making noise because you can't breathe and therefore that does not make sense whatsoever but it demonstrates that not is just trying to of course slide away from the reality of what's occurred but the neighbor clearly doesn't believe him and dawn actually appears at this point and says that he's trying to kill her which is terrifying isn't it that she even in that moment is saying that this man is literally trying to kill me. Now, the police didn't get involved at that point. And the following day, Dawn texted that neighbor and thanked him for the intervention. And on that occasion, Dawn did suffer bruises to her face, to her arms, to her legs. This is where he grabbed her because obviously he was choking her at points and he was throwing her around at points. And also she had bruises on her stomach, which is where he knelt on her. That kind of level of abuse is truly terrifying. When somebody kneels on your stomach, particularly if you're a big person, you're doing that to a small person, they're totally overwhelmed and overpowered. They are without any capacity to defend themselves, particularly if that person also puts their hands under their knees as well and uses it to restrain them in that way. And then of course, that person can violently attack the face, the neck, and chest, all of those areas, because the person can't retaliate in any way. The fact that he's doing this to Dawn, it really is saying that something terrible is likely to play out in the near future because it's getting worse and worse and worse. We get to a week before the wedding and Dawn goes ahead and contacts a friend. She's called June Crawshaw. She gets in touch with her on Facebook. And she actually confides in a friend that she's had two massive panic attacks during the previous four days. The message to her friend read, is it just nerves, June? Or just my gut instinct saying, get the hell out and run? It's so upsetting, isn't it, to imagine that she was feeling that way. How often do we try to convince ourselves when we know in our belly, in the pit of our stomach, that without a doubt we are making the wrong choice and yet we feel to conform or not to let other people down or to make sure that other people don't feel hurt, that we just press ahead, knowing all the while it isn't right. And that's exactly what Dawn's doing here. She's feeling it. Having panic attacks during the previous four days, that is a direct reaction to a knowledge that she's in danger. Because panic isn't just about being triggered by a certain scenario that's in front of you or suddenly feeling anxious because you've seen something that reminds you of something terrifying from the past or traumatic from the past. Panic can also be an indicator of needing to run, needing 
to flee. It comes from that fight, flight, freeze area and hers is saying, run like hell. But she doesn't. Like so many, she doesn't follow that gut instinct. In that same week that she's confided in a friend, she tells her daughter, Kiralee, I think something bad is going to happen. I think he'll leave me at the altar or I'll find out he's got another family. So at this point in time, not only is she dealing with the horrible abuse, she's also questioning the legitimacy of their relationship per se regarding his commitment to her. And she's got this sense of foreboding. But what really strikes me here is the fact that she's concerned that he might leave her at the altar or that she may have it confirmed that he's got another family and that she doesn't value herself in this moment. It's about her fear of being left. And all of us know that if only he had left her at the altar, if only she hadn't become his bride, if only he had indeed been an adulterer and removed himself entirely from her life, that could have been the best outcome for everybody, full stop. Of course, Kira Lee is listening to this and she doesn't believe for one minute that he has another partner or that he's going to leave her at the altar and she just reassures her mother that as far as she was concerned, she thinks her mum's being paranoid. But Dawn carries on and says, you know what, I just think something bad's going to happen and uh, what I'm going to tell you next is going to confirm not only that that gut instinct about things going wrong was correct, that that belief system about something bad happening was going to be confirmed in the most diabolical of manners. On the 27th of October 2021, Dawn and Nut, they get married. This is at the registry office in Brighouse at 2.15pm. And you can imagine that this is meant to be a really happy day. It's meant to be a time of great celebration. But Kira Lee says that she noticed that her mum didn't look right. She was shaking. She didn't look happy. But nonetheless, they carry on with the celebrations and these happen at the Prince Albert pub in Brighouse. There's around 20 people who are sharing the celebration with Dawn and Nor. And apparently they did seem to be in good spirit some they seem to be enjoying themselves and the couple actually returned home by taxi around 10 30 p.m now witnesses say that nut was apparently pretty drunk but then this would be expected i don't know i think weddings are one of those places that a good old drink is probably to be expected i personally am not a heavy drinker but when i go through a wedding I break these boundaries, which is why I always make sure that I can stay either at a very local hotel or ideally in the place that the festivities are happening because after five drinks, I'm basically paralytic. But being drunk after a wedding, certainly if it's your wedding, is pretty normal. But what we also know is if you're a violent perpetrator, alcohol is like throwing alcohol onto a fire, isn't it? and it exacerbates and amplifies bad behavior without a doubt. And remember, Nut's a bully, he's violent, he has very poor boundaries, and he looks for any excuse, basically, as far as I'm concerned, to harm Dawn. So with him being drunk, she's without doubt in danger, even though it is their wedding night together. Now, neighbors heard about 11 o'clock on their wedding evening, on that night, noises coming from Dawn and Nut's house, but they just assumed at this moment in time that that was probably them returning home drunk after the wedding reception together. But they did hear repeated banging for about an hour. And what they said is that the noise would go on for a short time, then it would stop, then it would restart again, which arguably I would say is a little bit concerning. But then I guess on a wedding night, certain banging noises may not be out of place, shall we say. But arguably the fact that this is a man who's been highly violent to this partner and the fact that banging is occurring would certainly stir my attention. And it does stir their attention, but they say because there's no screaming and shouting, no raised voices, they didn't feel that there was an actual threat 
taking place or somebody being put at risk in that moment in time, which I understand because they couldn't hear anything that was particularly untoward. Bear in mind, even though we know, and certainly some of the neighbours know, and certainly family members to some degree know that nut is a hideous excuse for a human being who should without doubt not be walking our streets ever again but to other people he was pretty good at putting on that facade you know the chameleons in the world we all know them i mean everybody's met a chameleon haven't they they're an absolute ass, and you know what they're like in private and you know the way that they speak about certain people in private and then you watch them in public being really charming and lovely and kind and nice and that person that they're reprehensible about will buy into this belief that they're a great human being. Chameleons are like that. It's what makes them so dangerous and ultimately sees many people defend them when they do horrible things because people can't believe for one minute that somebody that they believed was cool and nice and good could be anything other than cool and nice and good. And actually, as far as some of his neighbours are concerned, not appeared to be a really doting husband. So he basically fabricates this story that he wants to spend Halloween at home and then go away after. I don't get this, but for some reason he was like slightly obsessed with Halloween. One could say, well, maybe he was obsessed with Halloween because he had a nefarious, malevolent, dark soul and it was a celebration that he very much connected with. Maybe he was more, shall we say, devil than Jesus. Just throwing it out there, this guy seems a little weird because he likes this Halloween celebration more than Christmas. And with respect, there can be no celebration more important or wonderful than Christmas. We all know that. But nonetheless, apparently this argument's occurred because Dawn's like, I don't want to stay home for Halloween, I want to go away and I want to do things that are nice because we got married and apparently she accused him of being more concerned about Halloween than about her. Which would actually make perfect sense if you had just got married to a grown ass adult and they were actually concerned about not being in the neighbourhood for the Halloween celebrations. I mean, genuinely, it's weird. No matter how much you like trick or treat, it's just strange. You can always make a pumpkin somewhere else, can't you? But this is the argument that he said had occurred, and therefore he said he'd changed his plans to make her happy. Because we all know this man is very much concerned about Dawn's happiness. I mean, that in itself should have been a massive alarm bell for anyone who knew anything about the relationship, because this guy ain't going out of the way at all to make this woman happy. So basically he took her to Skegness on honeymoon for a couple of days, and that happened the day after the wedding. And this was basically at her request. So that was where they went to celebrate together. And then they came home and he tells the neighbours about all the time that they had away and what they did and the fun that they had together. Now, whilst in Skegness, on these few days that apparently have occurred, Dawn actually texts her daughter, but she texts her daughter on Nut's phone. And this is all about arranging with her daughter to meet up when she gets back. In the text, she also explains the reason that I haven't texted you on my phone is because I lost it on the wedding night. Don't know about any of you. If I had lost my phone on my wedding night, I would not have gone to Skegness. Genuinely, my whole life is in my phone. That's why I have find my phone, because I can never be separated from it, no matter what happens. But at the end of the day, it's a little bit suspicious, that isn't it? that you would be texting from your husband's phone, explaining why you can't text from your own. Arguably, it probably wouldn't arouse too much suspicion in her daughter because at least her mum's communicating with her. Also, during this period when they're gonna be in Skegness, a friend of Nut's actually texts him and Nut basically sent him back a picture message of the wedding. So he's very much trying to play the doting husband by sending this picture. And he also explains to this friend by text that he'd wanted to be home for Halloween and to go away after. But Dawn, of course, had wanted to go before, so they'd have to go. So he actually jokes in this message, got to please the wife, lol. When I say 
That is the most ironic comment that could ever be made regarding this man. I genuinely 100% mean it. Now, he didn't call that friend and the friend thought it was really weird because he said that he had a common behaviour pattern whenever he was away and he would usually call him several times just to catch up, but he didn't. On the 30th of October 2021, Nutt returns home. This is with his caravan and he actually gets the neighbour's son to help him back it into the driveway and there's no sign of Dawn. She just doesn't seem to be present. On the 31st of October 2021, this is when Dawn's meant to meet her daughter after returning from the honeymoon as they'd arranged, but she doesn't show up. Her daughter was immediately concerned because her mum did not let her down and she certainly would not let her down without getting in contact instantly. She just feels perturbed by this and concerned by this. And bearing in mind they know the history of the man that the mother has married, it's going to cause you anxiety when she just doesn't turn up. Nut meets with Dawn's daughter later that day. And of course, he's going to have an explanation. So he said, well, absolutely. Your mum set off to meet you that morning. And as far as he was concerned, they were together. So now he's all concerned at her disappearance. At the end of the day, it's not like Dawn whatsoever to not arrive. And now her daughter's thinking, oh my God, my mother's set off. She's never turned up. I don't know where she is. And Nut and her go sh literally looking all around Brick House for Dawn. They go around the shops, they check the hospitals. Nut at one point says, oh, you know what, maybe, She's just playing a trick on us by going missing on Halloween. Just gonna throw it out there, Not You're the weird obsessive about Halloween. And I don't think that Dawn's the kind of character who'd be like, oh, Halloween prank, terrify my family. Just go missing. Seems like a totally rational, normal thing for a middle-aged woman to do. If I'm not going missing from my family, terrifying them for a few hours every year, at least on one occasion, I'm not doing my job. Genuinely, that's what he says. Now, the neighbour who saw him on that day, they said that he was really panicky. And also, it didn't make sense to him because they said, listen, this guy is acting really strange, really panicky, but Dawn had literally been missing an hour at this point. So at the end of the day, if somebody's gone missing for an hour, I can appreciate that you might be a little bit worried. We've all had moments where we've been convinced that something terrible has happened to a member of our family. But if they've just been gone for an hour, that doesn't really resonate as being overly concerned. And actually the neighbour reassures Nut and says, like, she's just going to be out shopping or having a coffee. And the neighbour apparently joked, where have you buried her, Tomo? Don't get me wrong. I kind of feel like that neighbour was joking with intent. I can't verify that or clarify that, but genuinely, when somebody says that, I often think it's a passive aggressive dig using humour at the potential that you see in a person. And that neighbour is actually quite shocked because when he says that, not actually starts crying. And the neighbour said it really put him on the back foot because he'd never even seen this guy emotional. And it seemed like such a massively excessive reaction when you consider the fact that Nut's new wife had only been gone a really short time. Nut then actually enlists the help of that neighbour and says, can you come and help me look for Dawn? I want to go to the cemetery. I know, it's the first place that I would look. Where would my missing new wife go on this Halloween hijinks where she's hiding from us for a little bit of a prank. Probably the cemetery. Sounds totally rational. Also, it's the last place most of us would think of if we believed that our partner was alive. Just throwing it out there. I think on a psychological level right now, this man is associating Dawn with death and that's why the cemetery is the focus. I am just connecting these threads 
I'm not specifically stating I'm correct. It's speculation. But I genuinely think that it's speculation that makes sense. So he explains that the reason he wants to go to this cemetery is that apparently Dawn would go there and she would have this behaviour where she'd point out the graves where babies were buried. Don't get me wrong, I do remember when going and visiting my granddad's tree in the cemetery that I too, when I was a kid, would be transfixed with the baby graves because it just felt so wrong. I think this is something that a lot of us have probably done. I also used to read all of the pages in the paper that were all about death. You know, I wanted to see what the average age was in the obituaries just because it used to reassure me that I had a pretty long life ahead of me probably. But it's not uncommon, is it? Particularly for women, when you're visiting a grave, to notice that children and babies have lost their lives because it has a significant meaning for us, particularly if we're mothers. Same with fathers, without a doubt. Now, he tells that neighbour as well, who agrees to go and look for Dawn, that he's really glad that he's with him. And the reason that he says, I'm glad that you're with me, is because... He was worried that other people may suspect that he killed her. Hey, <laughs> just what? Can you imagine? Just, where are we going? We're going to the cemetery. Why are we going there? She used to like looking at graves of the babies. But why are we going there? Because I need to look like I'm going out looking for her. But why are we going there together now? Well, because if you don't come with me, there's a strong possibility that people are going to think, I don't know, that I killed her. And if you're with me, no one's going to think that I killed her. I've only been with you this morning, though. I don't, I don't think that's going to... I don't. No one will believe it. You're with me. That's all that matters. Come to the cemetery with me. It's fine. Again. One could say, at this moment in time, that Nut is trying to create... A very rudimentary, unsophisticated, one could call it, type of alibi. Anyway, the neighbour is like, I think this is weird. I think it's really weird that you said that to me. And it is weird. Because one, it wouldn't validate that he hadn't killed his wife. But it arguably suggests that there is something lying heavy on Nut's mind in this moment. Where he is trying to create some kind of way of looking innocent. Now, they fail to locate Dawn, so Nut returns home. And then, just let me throw this one out there. Just how does this lie with you guys when I just tell you that after they fail to locate said missing wife from cemetery and shops, and apparently he's really concerned about said wife, who has just disappeared into thin air, or is playing a Halloween prank. Who knows which one. But Nut goes back home and decorates his house and garden for Halloween. I mean, some of you may be generous and say, well, that's a distraction technique. Emma, he's distracting himself. He wants to make it look lovely for when she walks through the door. It's just a way of removing himself temporarily from the deep anxiety that he's feeling about the fact that his wife is not present. But that's not the case, is it? Literally, no one in their right mind goes back when their wife, child, partner, whatever, is missing and they are afraid for them and thinks, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to crack open the Halloween decorations because you know what? I want to make sure that I'm still doing what I believe is important, which is celebrating my favourite occasion, Halloween. Instantly, I'm suspicious of this man. Now, ironically as well, he actually, in the decoration of said garden, etc., included police crime scene tape. Very ironic, tragically ironic, but also, again, as far as I'm concerned, it demonstrates the fact that this man is not feeling any of the things that he's pertaining to feel when he's talking to other people about the fact that his wife is missing. Now, not he does go and report Dawn missing later that day. Obviously, 
after, I don't know, he's baked some French fancies in bright orange and black to ensure that he's completely on theme with the Halloween events that are going to unfold, probably been down the shops and, I don't know, bought some bits and pieces to give to the local children and certainly chiselled some interesting shapes into pumpkins because who wouldn't want to do that when somebody you love is missing? But again, like I say, we're seeing a complete lack of empathy with reality in this moment. By the time that he actually tells the police that she's missing, she's been gone for four hours. Officers respond quickly and they actually got to the property just eight minutes later. And I think it's really important to note that they get there really quickly because they're taking this seriously. Often we feel exasperated when police say that somebody isn't missing unless they've been gone for 24 hours. But the fact is, she's only been gone four hours and they are there. So the police need to take a missing persons report. So one of the things that they do is they search the house and the officer from the get-go is like, there's something wrong with this guy. He's sweating profusely. And bear in mind, police officers are very used to going to interview people. They're very used to anxious parents, anxious partners. They're also very used to massively guilty people. And because of that, they notice bodily actions, whether it's the language, or in this case, the sweating, or it might be nervous scratching of hands or face. They take this in because if it's distinct from other scenarios that they have visited, it stands out. And it wasn't that he was having a heart attack, by the way. Sweating profusely is a sign and a symptom of a heart attack. Not in this case. He just seemed to be nervous. Some could suggest that he was worried and was trying to cover something up. So Nort then has to relay to the police what had happened, the movements of Dawn that day. And he said that Dawn had left the house at 9.30 a.m. That she was going to go and visit her daughter at Wilkinson's shop in Brighouse, but she'd never turned up. And then he said his reaction to that when he found out that she'd never turned up was to just drive around Brighouse that morning with Dawn's daughter just looking for her. He also says, look, I'm really worried about my wife's welfare. And he says she's been having problems with her mental health and also tells the police that she had a secret drinking problem and suffered epileptic fits. So now we're in a scenario where not only is she missing, we've gone from, oh, maybe she's just playing a little prank on us for Halloween to, well, actually, officer, the reality is she's an alcoholic and also she's got serious epileptic fits and also she's got serious mental health issues, I think. You can just see the kind of story that he's trying to paint right now. Because if you can express to a police officer and get them to believe that this individual may be a risk to themselves, may have a reason for disappearing, also has a dependency issue that they're keeping secret from the family, then you start to paint a picture of possibility where they are not the person that the people who know them believe. And if you can get away with that, it can sometimes sway an investigation. Suddenly they're not necessarily looking for a body, shall we say, they're looking for an individual who's just disappeared because they couldn't cope anymore, or indeed has caused themselves harm. But again, this is highly unsophisticated, there's no evidence for what he's saying, and the police are obviously gonna check with her nearest and dearest. Now, before the police had actually arrived at Nutt's house, a father of a neighbour had actually seen him dragging a suitcase towards a field. I kid you not. What I will say about where Nut and Dawn lived is we should all live in places like that on the whole because these guys saw everything from breaking up scenarios where she was at risk, questioning him about movements, concerning about information that he was telling them and kind of relaying that to the police, but also noticing out of the ordinary and extraordinary activities that seem to take place in that area. And this is what has been noted. This father of this neighbor has been like, what the hell is that guy doing? Let's be honest. 
for the most of us, if we were to see somebody struggling, shall we say struggling, because there's a difference, isn't there? Like, you know, wheeling a suitcase nonchalantly across a park or across woodland to travel somewhere that you need to go, such as to visit a friend and stay with them. I'm saying it would still draw some attention, but what you'd notice was the person was traveling with ease. If you are dragging a suitcase towards a field, there is something relatively heavy within it that likely should not be in it. It's as simple as that. That is instantly going to cause concern and you are going to notice it and this neighbour does. And to add to this concern, they get really suspicious when they find out that Dawn's missing. So several neighbours, well, they begin searching the area that Nord had headed towards. Literally, guys, these neighbours are amazing because they are just like, get on the home watch jackets. We're going to go and check this out. They just become instant detectives. They know something really bad has potentially happened and they don't want this man to escape or evade capture. And they want to know if that suitcase contains something sinister that they discover it before he has a chance to remove it. And so they just go out all over the area that he had been seen taking that case and they find it. Those neighbours who certainly got the memo of do not risk offending, they genuinely did, they actually find the suitcase. It's in undergrowth on a field of Asgarth Avenue and it was just dumped there like rubbish, just dumped amongst all the litter. And of course, they don't at this point know what's in it. I have no doubts whatsoever they had a suspicion, but they're aware that they are potentially coming to the wrong conclusions. So they just open it slightly and then they realize straight away there's a body in it. And that in itself must have been highly traumatizing for those neighbors because even when you are all together and you feel like you have agreed to do something because you believe it's the right thing to do, the preparedness that you will have to experience on a mental level to manage that kind of trauma is something very few people actually cultivate. So you might think this is the right thing to do and I'm glad that we're doing it, but the minute that you actually realize, God, this is a body, this is a human being, this is alive. It can be incredibly challenging for you to manage that on a day-to-day -day basis from that point on. Now, before they actually notify the police of the fact that they've found this suitcase, one of the neighbors actually speaks to Nut. And at this point, he jokes again that he had basically felt really glad that he'd gone with him on the search because Otherwise, people might have thought that he had dumped Dawn's body. Bear in mind, that neighbour was then absolutely 100% convinced that the body in the case was Dawn's and they notified police. Just imagine being that neighbour. And there are different ways of dealing with this, aren't there, in those moments? Like, I think I would have just been straight away on the phone 999. I wouldn't have wanted to cause the perpetrator to be aware that the body was in the suitcase because if they had actually killed that human being and I had surfaced that body, I might be at risk. But also, I don't want to give them any lead. I don't want them to leave the area. But arguably, this neighbour was probably telling him to see what the reaction was like. And as opposed to the reaction being one that we would expect of horror or shock or fear or where the hell is this body, is it Dawn's? Instead, it's very much a, oh, well, it's a good job that you were my alibi, right? So again, he's just thinking about his own needs. Bearing in mind, he's been caught bang to rights to some degree because we've seen the father of a neighbor recognizing that it's him dragging a suitcase, said suitcase, that then the neighbors went out and found, which happens to have a body in it. So it's either that he's been dragging Dawn's body in the suitcase or somebody else's body in the suitcase. Either way, he was seen dragging the suitcase and it had a body in it. The police 
are informed, they arrive at the crime scene around just before 5 p.m. They find that the body is indeed in the suitcase, it's under a tree, and very quickly they establish that the body in the suitcase is Dawn's. She's half naked and she's been folded in half. Guys, this was just four days after her wedding day. When they did the autopsy on Dawn's body, they found that she had really significant damage to her neck. It suggested that she'd been asphyxiated and also she had really deep breathing to both sides of her head. She had a black eye, she'd suffered lacerations, she had deep bruising to her jaw, to the left side of her face, she had a fractured nose, she had a fractured eye socket. Guys, this is a really, really high level force trauma to the body. And they also noted in the autopsy that her body had again been damaged after death. So several of her bones had been broken and therefore you could tell that it was during manipulating the body into the case that that trauma had occurred as well as the initial trauma that she'd experienced that had led to her death. But it says something about the way an individual treats that person with such contempt and disrespect. I mean, you've killed them. And now all you can think about is trying to get away with it. So you don't even care what you do to her body after you've taken her life from her. You just break it and manipulate it in a shape that's required so that you can dispose of it more easily. Now, it's around the same time that the police have recognised all of this that they get a call from a solicitor. And she tells the police that a Thomas Knott had advised her that his wife's body had been dumped in a suitcase and not then hands himself into police the same day. Which, of course he does, because it's good sense to do so. I mean, mate, you were literally seen with the suitcase with your wife's body in and the neighbours literally found it because they saw where you went with it. Also, you've got a history of violence and neighbours who acknowledged that Dawn was afraid for her life and you've been to prison for this violence. And there was a non-molestation order and a prevention of you having any contact with your prior relationship. I mean, this guy genuinely is bang to rights. It's as simple as that. He knows that and he knows that actually turning yourself in and admitting to charges, or at least admitting to charges you're willing to, is gonna make it more bearable when you are given a sentence. It shouldn't be. I don't think somebody turning themselves in or admitting anything should be why they get a lesser sentence. Just kind of think they deserve the sentence that they deserve, which in this case would be a very long time as far as I'm concerned. Again, I just need like a judge's hat, do I? Just to be sat here in a wig. It's like the world according to him. Not gets arrested, of course he does when he's turned himself in. He gets charged with Dawn's murder. But of course he says, Look, I didn't murder her. I didn't want to murder her, at least. I didn't intend to kill Dawn. I didn't intend to cause her serious harm. And of course, bear in mind, that's the mental element required for murder. You have to be somebody that they can prove, beyond reasonable doubt, had intended to cause serious harm and death in these cases. So he's saying, well, I have killed her. I did dispose of her body, but I absolutely did not mean to kill her. He said, what actually played out was that I actually had to restrain her during an argument on the 30th of October. Apparently she'd been very depressed after returning home from two days in Skegness. I mean, we've all felt like that, haven't we? Couple of days caravanning. We come home, slip into a deep depression because you know what, it's so much better in Skegness than it is here. Skegness is actually quite nice, I'm not gonna deny. But the point is, they've been away two days and they could go back if they wanted to. Just throwing it out there, not really a reason for slipping into a deep depression. But this is his argument. And apparently at this point, he said that she asked him for a divorce. We will all cheer if that actually played out and she did because my God, she deserved to divorce him. He is the biggest a-hole that I have described in quite a while and I describe a lot of a-holes in this video. 
Nut also said that she put him in jail before after alleging that he tried raping her and assaulting her and basically claimed that Dawn had threatened to do it again. And then apparently she had started screaming at him and he just hit her in the face. Then he put his arm around her neck and accidentally asphyxiated her to death. You know, this five foot woman who literally has been beaten black and blue before, we are expected to believe, suddenly got the strength and confidence to attack him verbally and threaten him, even though we know that that would put her at risk of her life. And the response of him is to punch her in the face and then, you know, just try to restrain her, but inevitably murder her or kill her, as he's trying to say. Because, I mean, that's what restraints do. I mean, insecure homes all over the UK and the police all over the UK who restrain people very, very regularly. I mean, they all die, don't they? All those people just die. Bodies all over the street. No, they don't. It wouldn't take any work whatsoever for him to literally restrain this woman. She's tiny. She hasn't been in the background training in mixed martial arts. She's not suddenly become some kind of kung fu ninja expert who he is now in a position of needing to protect himself from. No, she is a slight woman. And he's trying to suggest that firstly, she provoked him. Secondly, she was being aggressive towards him and threatening him. And most importantly, that in the end, he had no choice but to try to restrain her. Now, just to humor nuts, explanation for a minute. Let's just humour him with his description and explore what we would consider made sense if what he said were the case. Oh my god, I've just murdered my wife. Sorry, I keep using the word murder. He would say kill, but we all know it's murder. I've just killed my wife. What will I do? It was in the heat of a moment. It was a crime of passion. She was being highly abusive to me. I don't know how this has happened. What do I do next? Answer A, dial 999, get the emergency services, acknowledge what's occurred. B, speak to a family friend, explain what terrible things I've done and enable them to act in an appropriate manner. Or C, just hide a body in a cupboard in the kitchen. I mean, that's what every innocent person in the history of accidental deaths has done. You're like, I have accidentally killed this person. What I must do is hide that person in a cupboard. Yeah, that's what I should do. So this is his excuse that he didn't actually mean to murder her, did. But as opposed to actually asking to get some help for her or acknowledging what he has done, instead, he thinks about saving his own skin, which is what no one who is innocent would ever have to do because they were literally innocent. Anyway, he says after he reported it to the police that she was missing and he'd been told that the officers were on their way, he needed to dispose of the body really quickly again said no innocent person ever. I can imagine this guy you in the police interview. Just run me through it. Just, just run me through what happened. It was really bad. It was terrible. She was screaming, she was shouting, she was threatening me. She got to a point where she was literally telling me that I was gonna go to prison, she was gonna divorce me. I lost it a bit. I did punch her in the face, but then just tried to restrain her and I got her in a headlock. And the consequence of that was that I accidentally killed her. I can't believe I did it. So then what did you do? I thought I need to dispose of her body, but it was an accident. I know, but I thought that maybe it was a quicker way of just making sure that I didn't have to deal with expensive funeral fees. No one's gonna believe this. I do take your point. Anyway, this is what literally this man is trying to do. So he said as the police were coming, he knew he had to get rid of the body. The suitcase was too small. So at this point, 
he also was aware that rigor mortis had set into Dawn's body and he had to bend her legs to fit inside, which meant that he had to break her shin bones and he had to break several of her ribs in the process. Now, the police are very suspicious of Nutt's versions of events because he's a massive liar and he's a horrific abuser. Why would they believe him? Bear in mind, he had actually claimed that Dawn had died after their return from the honeymoon in Skegness. The autopsy absolutely suggested and verified that she'd been killed earlier. So they believed that she had died on October the 27th. That was her wedding day. They believed that that woman with that sense of foreboding, with that fear about something bad happening was literally killed on the day that was gonna be the happiest of her life. Investigators believed that Nutt's claim of a honeymoon in Skegness was just a lie. They think he killed Dawn beforehand and then he'd gone there by himself. Police were able to establish that Dawn had last been seen alive by the taxi driver who literally dropped them off from their wedding reception. Now, bearing in mind Nutt was drunk, because it was his wedding night, it, you'd expect him to go to bed, but shortly after midnight, Nutt was basically spotted at a cash point in casual clothes and he withdrew 200 quid from Dawn's account. Also, he was wearing a hoodie to cover his face, which is odd behaviour for an innocent person. Now, shortly after 1am, he gets spotted on CCTV going outside into the back garden for a few minutes. Again, it's really strange behaviour. On your wedding night, most of us are doing more fun things on our wedding night, or we're unconscious because of alcohol consumption. At 5.30 a.m., the neighbour of Nuts is outside having a cigarette. And of course, Nut doesn't expect anyone to be outside at that time. He's kind of shocked that this neighbour has seen him. And the neighbour said he did seem to be quite subdued in his behaviour. And it's at this point Nut handed him earnings Dawn had borrowed from his wife for the wedding. So she'd borrowed some money and he was giving it back. And he tells this neighbour that Dawn's in bed and it's the following morning around 11.30 a.m. Nut tells the neighbour that Dawn actually had a hangover and was still in bed, which would be contextual. It's not unusual for people to have hangovers after a serious night of celebration. So that would make sense to the neighbour. Later, neighbours noticed that the car and the caravan was gone and also they noticed that the curtains in the house were closed. In fact, they always noticed that she would leave them open when she went away. So these neighbors really noticed these little idiosyncrasies about the way that Dawn lived and it kind of provokes attention that there were disparities in the behavior they expect. Also, a neighbor noticed that washing had been left out and they felt that that was really strange too because Dawn was incredibly organized. So it just, duck out. It seemed really odd. Police managed to get hold of the CCTV footage of the couple's house and they noticed straight away there's no trace at all of Dawn. There's no sign of her getting into a car at any point during the five hours before Nut sets off with the caravan to Skegness. So they can see she didn't go. The police established also that Nut's vehicle went through a toll bridge. It went through that toll bridge around 10.50 a.m. and they believe that then Nut stops in this lay-by which is near Skegness and it's one that he and Dawn were familiar with and they'd stay there sometimes because it was just free. It didn't have any fees associated with it. This is where the police believe he sent a message to Dawn's daughter on his phone pretending to be Dawn. You know, saying that they'd gone away for a few days, buying himself some time essentially. And this is also of course where he explained that the reason that she was texting her daughter on his phone was because she had lost her own phone at the wedding. Then the police are able to trace CCTV from another toll bridge in Skegness, and they notice here there was absolutely no sign of Dawn in the vehicle. However, that was not the most damning evidence, no. The piece de resistance of evidence in this case against Nut was CCTV, the footage that was taken on the 31st of October 2021, showing him dragging a suitcase to the bottom of his garden and through a fence before dumping it in bushes in a field around 1.20 p.m. Also, CCTV also captured him trying to erase 
the tracks left by the suitcase wheels in the garden. Just gonna throw it out there. I don't think that the tracks in the garden and across the field directly leading back to your house is the problem, not. I think the problem is the CCTV that captured you doing all of that. Just gonna, just gonna throw out a bit of life advice there, a bit of life advice there. It doesn't matter if there's no tracks. What matters is you're literally seen doing it, captured, both on CCTV and by your neighbour's father and actually by the neighbours who then tracked the suitcase and found it. Not the brightest tool, is he? So earlier that day, what had happened is that Nutt had tried to create this ruse, which we all know. He'd searched for Dawn with her daughter and her neighbours, which I find utterly reprehensible, but we know that killers often place themselves at the scene and in the midst of the search because firstly, they want to create a distraction and a diversion for authorities to not look at them, but also because a lot of the time they feel a sense of power knowing that they know exactly what's happened and they psychologically enjoy the fact that everybody's looking for somebody that they've killed. The fact that he did that knowing that she was dead is horrific. You know, he already knew when he went and met her daughter that her body was stuffed in a cupboard kitchen at their home. He is a horrific human being. Not later pleaded not guilty to murder. Yeah, yeah. He's like, I didn't really intend to murder her. No, you did, you absolutely did. No, 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 I'm gonna plead not guilty. It's infuriating. But this man obviously believed that he could get away with hopefully accepting a lesser deal to manslaughter. But the CPS and the police were absolutely determined to prosecute Nut for murder. And I'm so glad because sometimes you will see that deals are made because it costs less money and you certainly get a guilty verdict and that means that a case is closed and families have certain answers and closure. But I'm so glad that in a murder so reprehensible, a man who has been a perpetrator of domestic abuse and violence for such a long time was not given that opportunity, that they just went full throttle prosecuting him. There was an 11 day trial. This was in July this year, 2022. And Nutt was found guilty of Dawn's murder. Dawn's family, they cheered in the public gallery as the verdict was announced. Nutt's response to their celebration, not the celebration that we would usually associate with an emotional response because this wasn't a celebration for anything good. This was just a celebration of justice. It's never gonna ease the agony that they have to carry knowing what happened to their mother, knowing what happened to their loved one. But you'd imagine that this man who knowingly and willingly ruined that family's lives to some degree and certainly stole the life of a much loved woman. He didn't show any remorse, humility, he didn't say sorry. He actually responded by saying, F you. I wish at points like this, the judge would be able to go, oh, I'm sorry, sorry. Did he just, did he just say F you to the family? Did he, did that, did that happen? Yes, it happened. Just hang on a minute. Just, just special book, book. Yes, this is the normal law book. Yes, you can get quite a lot of time there. But uh, just go to clause 3.1. Ooh, clause 3.1. Swears aggressively at the family who have lost a loved one. Oh, I'm going to apply the extra 350 year rule. And also 74 years in the salt mines. Again, doesn't happen, but one would wish it could in such circumstances. Because the very fact that he thinks he has any legitimate right to speak like that to the bereaved family, genuinely, it just defies logic, it defies ration, and it certainly defies humanity as far as I'm concerned. On the 19th of August, 2022, Nutt was sentenced to life with a minimum term of 21 years. I genuinely wish he had got longer because I think his history of domestic abuse means that he's never ever gonna be safe. 
I know that he's going to have to serve that 21 years and there is nothing to say that he will definitely be paroled after that. I genuinely still think that is too lenient. Since his incarceration, he's actually already being attacked by another inmate in Leeds prison. I guess we could say, well, let's see how much he likes being on the receiving end of such treatment for the next 21 years of his life. I'm not inciting violence. I'm just saying that karma can be a bitch. What I've talked about today is important to get across because one in four women will suffer domestic abuse in a lifetime. On average, two women are murdered every single week in the UK by an abusive partner. That went up during lockdown and the pandemic measures because stress incites this kind of behaviour further in these perpetrators. Many people, as I've said, do not understand why women in such situations do not leave relationships. But the reason is for lots of multifaceted concerns. First of all, many fear the repercussions of leaving. So 41% of women killed by an abusive partner had separated or taken steps to separate from their partner. This is a really dangerous time for women when they make those decisions. Others have been isolated from their families completely, so they've got no support. They don't have anyone to turn to. Others don't leave because they're ashamed or embarrassed. Others because they're just in denial about what's happening. And others because they don't have the resources. They don't have the finances. They don't even have access to their own passports. They have literally had their identity, individuality and opportunity stolen from them. The charity IDAS, which is the Independent Domestic abuse service, they've laid out warning signs to look out for in abusive relationships, which is really important because a lot of people don't realise they're in them. These include your partner wanting you all to themselves and basically making you feel that it's not fair of you to see people of meaning, such as going and spending time with your friends and family. They want to make it difficult for you, so they'll isolate you in that way. They may say unkind things. They may be really inconsiderate to your feelings. You may find that they pressure you to do things that doesn't feel right. And when you do things that are important to you, they make you feel guilty for doing it. And if you don't do what they want, they also make you feel bad about making those decisions. They want you to consider them the center of your universe. And if you fail to, there'll be repercussions. Also behaviors such as wanting to know exactly where you are all the time, texting you constantly, calling you constantly throughout the day and being angry if you don't immediately respond. They'll use worry as an excuse or care about you that suggests that this is why they're calling you and texting you. It's because I love you, I care about you. But if it doesn't feel right, that's likely because you know they're trying to control you. Also, if you feel frightened around your partner, if you feel like you're constantly walking on eggshells, that's a really important indicator. If you're being gaslit, this is when people try to make you feel like the things that you've actually experienced, they're not real. Or they make you question the version of events as they played out. They make you reason with unreasonable. They may even make you think that the memories that you've had are incorrect and convince you that they remember things differently and they remember things correctly. Also, of course, big red flag, if they've ever been violent to you, if they've ever been aggressive to you, if they've made threats to hurt you in any way. And also, another big issue within abusive relationships is the lack of responsibility. They take no responsibility whatsoever for their actions. They just blame you or they blame people around you for the reasoning behind why they have acted the way that they've acted. Lots of you listening will have been in abusive relationships, but maybe some of you are still. And if you're in an abusive relationship, you have to remember you're not alone. There are people who can help and you deserve that help. If you don't feel able to speak to your family, to your friends, if you don't feel that you can confide in those, there are organizations that can support you. These include Refuge, Women's Aid and Victim Support. Also, the Bright Sky app, that's something that you can download. The most important thing is to realise that you do not have to suffer in silence and you absolutely deserve to receive the support that you're entitled to. Your life is worthy and no one has a right to treat you badly and believe that things can be better and your life can change for the better. Dawn's daughters, Cody, Kalena, 
and Kira. They're walking the Yorkshire Three Peaks this year. That's on the anniversary of their mother's death. And the money raised from the walk will go to the charity Advocacy After Fatal Domestic Abuse. They want to ensure that no grieving family has to face the horror of a murder trial without support. They're incredible, aren't they? The fact that they're creating legacy, but not just creating legacy because the absolute and ultimate meaning that their mother had to them and their lives so that they can also prevent others struggling when they too face the loss of a loved one through murder. Cody stated this, in October last year, mine and my family's heart was shattered to pieces when we received the news that our beloved Dawn Walker had been killed. Dawn was a beautiful soul who would do anything for anybody. She would give you her last bit of money, even if she was struggling herself. She was the best mum anyone could ever ask for. We want the victims to be able to reach out and not feel scared to do so. We want them to know that there is another way. It can be hard but they are strong and they can get out. I think the words that she speaks are really profound and powerful. She's letting people know, even if you're a victim and you are struggling and you are scared, there is a way forward, there is a way out and you deserve that option. Don't stay in relationships because you feel afraid because there are avenues which can free you from those circumstances and my God, Nobody wants anybody to end up in a scenario like Dawn. She lost her life because of this excuse for a human being, a man who was violent for his entire adult life to women. He stole her from her family, an irreplaceable piece in that family's puzzle and that defines and changes the rest of their lives. Domestic abuse is a blight in this world, but it's also common. And if there is another thing that I would take from today's video, it's that those neighbours, wow. Everybody needs neighbours like that. Some may think that they're nosy, some may think they're intrusive, but at the end of the day, they're also individuals who risk offending. And potentially when people do that, you make such a difference to a victim's life. Let me know your thoughts and feelings on this video. If you want to support me on Patreon, there's a link. If you want to support me in YouTube membership, there's a link. I appreciate every single one of you massively. I have followed this case since the very beginning. I wanted to make sure that I had the verdicts before I actually commented on it. Let me know your thoughts. Give me a like, give me a comment. If you fancy subscribing to the channel, get your notifications on, then you'll never miss any of my content. Crime and consistency, every Wednesday and Sunday, I'm always here. Join me for a live chat and premiere. And also don't forget about the M mattress. At the end of the day, you too could be as comfortable as I am. See you again next time, guys. Take care.